Welcome to The Art of Flow, a podcast that explores connecting with your body, mind, and soul via movement arts and creative exploration. Through conversations with movement artists, circus performers, flow artists, and fire dancers. My name is Morgan Dalgano, and I'm the creator and host of the podcast, a flow arts enthusiast and a life coach. Feel free to check out some of my other work with individuals looking to get unstuck and discover peace and energy at ignitevibrancy.com. And occasionally I will bring coaching concepts into the artistic dialogues. The Art of Flow is a free public resource for creators, teachers, and supporters of the arts who are interested in flow arts and fire dancing. It is available for mainstream distribution on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, YouTube, Stitcher, and at theartofflowpodcast.com. If you believe in a show that provides inspiration for artists and conversations on the creative process, please support the podcast on Patreon to keep it going. As a supporter, you can earn early access full-length interviews, submit questions for interviewees, be mentioned in an episode, and get a behind-the-scenes look at how the podcast is made. That's the Art of Flow if you're searching for it online. You can also follow the podcast on Instagram and Facebook to receive shorter clips of episodes, updates, and notifications when new episodes are released. Today on The Art of Flow, we'll be talking with Glenn, the designer, innovator, who in 1987 changed the way that we use flower sticks by creating tassels or fringes and using the concept of flop in order to transform the prop. He's going to join us and chat about his different inventions and innovations and the theories and philosophies behind them, as well as how he views dancing as part of the greater human experience and share his philosophy with us. Hey, Glenn, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, how are you you doing? Good. So I'm curious, how did you discover fire dancing and flow art? Once you start calling it flow arts, you kind of give it a, a historic time period where it starts because uh, before then they didn't call it flow arts. Uh, like uh, doctors called it dexterity play when they're like assigning it to you when you're um, not coordinated, which I was. I mean, actually, uh, I was diagnosed as having bad eye-hand coordination in school. Uh, They told me I should, you know, build models or put together puzzles or all this stuff. Really what I needed was to uh, not have them try to make me write left-handedly the way everybody writes with their right hand because it's not the same motion. I mean, with your left hand, you're pulling towards yourself and with your right hand, you're you're pushing away. So it's it's a it's totally a different motion. And see, I, I'd been through a different school every year for the first four years of school and two schools in my fourth year. So uh, I miss the normal, you know, you start here and you go to here and you you have a curriculum because like I I was in four different curriculums that were all going at different speeds for different people. And, uh, I really never was challenged by school. At the, uh, the classes always seemed boring and it seemed like uh, every year in school we had to learn what we learned last year in school. It just felt like there wasn't ever anything new for the first uh like until junior high school and I could start picking classes and uh, choosing what I wanted to learn and uh, had access to better libraries. And, you know, it was pretty bad before the internet. Like if you wanted to learn something, you had to maybe look it up in the reader's guide to periodical literature and and then have like that periodical sent to your local library and like just to, Google something might take you a couple of weeks, you know, just for a quick something that you would just Google real fast right now. So um, I don't know, there wasn't really uh, any kind of community or any kind of flow arts when I got started. Uh, 
you know, I, I think the first time I did something that I, you might think of as flow arts was like uh, on the way home from preschool camp, I was kind of like knocking a cup around, you know, one of those folding camping cups, those aluminum ones that telescope out. And I really liked that, the mechanism of it. And, uh, you know, I was trying to get it to like bounce and telescope at the same time. So I could have it like open in midair and then land on the back of my other hand. And, you know, I'm doing this loose in the back of a station wagon, you know, way in the way back of the station wagon, no seat belt, uh, no airbags, uh, you know, you know, when we bought that car, we had to have seat belts installed as like an aftermarket option because we wanted them, you know, so uh, that kind of shows you how far back all of this stuff started. I mean, there wasn't anything like what there is now. Uh, and like, as as time went on, it, you know, we we got to like, say I was about 10 years old, I'm swinging stuff around that's attached to a long cord I made out of rubber bands, like a hundred rubber bands together, strung together with another cord just like it next to it that's like twisted did, like I made bungee cord out of rubber bands because they didn't you couldn't buy bungee cord that long I mean you could buy bungee cords to hold you know with hooks on the end but like there just wasn't any source to just buy bungee uh, and so like I, I played with that kind of stuff I was about 10 and I discovered fire and flammable liquids it was pretty natural when I discovered flammable liquids for me to, uh, you know, I've seen fire breathers and I, you know, I practiced a couple of times spraying water from my mouth without getting it on my face. And, uh, I figured if I had something lit out at arm's length and sprayed fuel onto it, that I could breathe fire. And uh, nobody taught me how to do it. Nobody told me how stupid it was. Uh, well, you know, about 45 minutes later, the police showed up, but I was able to talk to the police and assure them that, uh, yeah, they were right. And I totally understood what they were saying about safety and that I would stop doing that forever right now. They didn't even talk to my parents who were both in the, in the house and, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I owe my survival to the present day to the fact that my parents didn't find out about a whole lot of the stuff I used to do when I was a kid until I was an adult and could talk to them as a peer. I later on got into juggling. Uh, I, I, w I bought a book that told about how to build uh, circus bikes and it had a chapter on juggling. When I saw it, this written down in black and white, it, it was pretty clear. You know, I, the idea of how to juggle, I, that was something I couldn't teach myself. Tossing three balls in a circle like that. And then I, you know, I learned from the book, you don't toss them in a circle. <laughs> you know? um, that changed things. Yeah. Does it, it sounds... It, it, it sounds like already you were inventing and making things just because of your lifestyle and your community and the time. But then, yeah, yeah. Uh, we made a lot of we made a lot of toys, uh, like uh, sidewalk surfing <laughs> started when I was young, uh, and. Uh, you know, that's skating, <laughs> uh, skateboards and skating. But like my first skateboard literally said sidewalk surfer on it. I mean, that was the name of the skateboards. It had metal wheels and the metal wheels broke. And, uh, you know, one of the very first things we would do when we'd get a skateboard is we'd put better wheels on it. And when, uh, when you could get hard, solid uh, 
rubber wheels for skates. That's when skateboard skateboards change when they had those really nice flexible trucks on them. And, uh, well, I was kind of already past skateboards by then. I was I was on the bicycles and and uh, mini bikes and motorcycles and like that. We were able to pretty easily break every part of our bike and repair it with something stronger. You know, like uh, we broke the hub, broke the axle. So we replaced it with a motorcycle part and used motorcycle spokes and then uh, do stuff to, to reinforce the wheel, get the strongest wheels we can. And then we break the forks because the wheel was strong enough to make the forks break. And so we would always, uh, every, every bike you get, you get Schwinn forks because they had a really flat bar on the front and you could have a bar welded alongside that to make that the front forks be like bomb proof. And, you know, and then we're breaking handlebars. I mean, we just, we rebuilt bikes because of them needing to be fixed from us breaking them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that's how BMX started. Most jumps have got like a ramp and a down ramp, an up ramp and a down ramp. This had like about a two inch up ramp and then a, like a 14 foot fall onto, onto just flat. And so uh, it really took some, uh, you know, really lengthening your body out and, and having your feet on the pegs just right and, and landing just right. And if you did it just right, your whole bike would break at once pretty much. <laughs> and, and if your bike could stand that, then uh, uh, it was probably about three times the weight of a BMX bike now, but it could do just about anything a BMX bike could do now, except for stuff where it has to be weightless and you hold it with one hand or something. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the era we were in. Um, you know, we weren't going to let, let our lives be safe at all. So you mentioned juggling and that that was something you're drawn to and taught yourself. When did you realize that innovating, like improving on these inventions was something that you wanted to do long-term? It took a long time to realize that that's even what I was doing. Uh, that the thing with the cup and the thing with the rubber bands and the thing with the spitting kerosene, oh God, kerosene. Uh, the thing with the learning juggling. Uh, actually, by then, I had an excuse because I had uh, started working as a clown at that point. And uh, juggling is one of those skills where it, you really have to spend a lot of time to get good at it. And that kind of time investment can feel like a waste if you're not gonna do it for money. But if you're a clown, then that's a really easy investment to make. And it's not even a commitment because you can just kind of half-ass it as a clown. I mean, I know a lot of clowns will hate me for it, but, but uh, really that's one of the reasons that clowns can do anything because they can't do everything perfectly, but they can do a, a wide range of things. And, uh, like in a circus environment, you would, you would have like a, a tightrope walker dressed in the clown's costume. I, I guess I'm spoiling it for everybody now, but uh, you know, that's not really the clown up there. It's the tightrope walker, but um, you know, the illusion is that a clown can do anything. And uh, it's partly true. I mean, one of the things that clowns do in a, as a, now, when I say clown, I'm talking about a variety performer who works on a, on a casual basis for individual gigs. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, a birthday party clown. But, you know, birthday parties really aren't most of it. Uh, but I, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about clowning. I'm not talking about 
uh, circus, although some of this leans in that direction. Uh, Thank you for so, defining that because I know everyone has such different definitions. It's helpful. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a even even in oh yeah, you could just you could get smaller and smaller and subdivide clowns down to uh, yeah within an inch of their life. Uh, so when I was learning clowning. One of the things that I learned about clowning is that a lot of clown gags rely on a thing that either does something or looks like it does something, you know, like a, a big red button that you push. It doesn't really do anything, but like the whole the whole gag is like about you know, keeping the other clown from pushing the button. And, you know, as soon as he gets a chance, even though he knows he shouldn't do it, he, he goes over there and he wants to touch it. And everybody knows how tempting that is. It's, the, it's that uh, mysterious mechanism. What's it gonna do? Uh, but, you know, or, or like a hammer that uh, is, is big and soft, but it's made for like, uh, bopping somebody with or just there's a lot of different things in clowning that need to be built and uh the the clown who builds the stuff is called the producing clown or the production clown and uh that's kind of a key gig in a clown group is the guy who can keep the the magic props working and keep the uh uh you know maybe you've got an umbrella that you open up and it's just made out of rags and it doesn't really have any structure so it keeps getting tangled on itself and breaks about every four times you use it so you got to have somebody who knows how to like gently baby it back into into shape and so i kind of liked doing that kind of stuff of like making something that I imagined or making something that would do something I imagined or making something look like something else or uh, making something of not really knowing what it's gonna be because I started out with something that looked interesting and I started adding stuff to it. Uh, it sounds like you were really drawn to the maker aspect of things and that it was available in this intersection of interest. So clowning was something you were doing and also this producing clown, the natural way for those interests in your life to intersect. You can kind of get dip into the flow state pretty well as you're building things. But I really think that uh, moving with them and having, uh, having some music and not having so much focus on the on the construction, I think, uh, is leads me more into a, a flow state. Feeling through movement. Yeah, yeah. Um, or having uh, maybe not so much feeling through movement as uh, just moving. I don't. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to say it, but. Uh, uh, enjoying the movement that's happening as it's happening and trying to uh, trying to get down into the nuances of the movement, not just like, uh, you know, raise your hand, you know, but raise your hand in a specific way. Uh, you get that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it's a magical feeling when you're fully being in the moment and what you're doing. You created the flower sticks that we know today in 1987 by using the concept of flop to make tassels and fringes. And then you shared these designs with as many people as possible, and as we're curious, making this innovation a part of the public domain. What inspired these specific modifications to what they were devil sticks? at the time? Uh, 
Well, there's uh, the sticks that I modified were a thin wooden dowel about 20 inches long and wrapped with uh, that gauzy tape that's, that you like wrap before you put on boxing gloves that uh, it doesn't really even have very much structure. It's just uh, a little bit sticky and has a little bit of a surface texture. And uh, then those had, um, had uh, discs screwed onto the end of them. Uh, like a, a disc with a hole and a disc with no hole and the disc with the hole was put onto the end of the dowel and the disc with no hole had a screw screwed through it. And those two and the, and the joint were all kind of glued together. And it, it wasn't uh, like, it was definitely a toy, like uh, a child's toy for a little kid who's not gonna be very aggressive with it at all. Uh, I got it at a dead show and, and uh, way, way, way before the dead show was over, like in under three hours, it was reduced to just not, like, I was just using a bare wood thing with, with the gauze hanging off of it. And uh, the gauze hanging off of it kind of made it look, work a little bit better because it kind of, it slowed the, it, it gave wind resistance. It kind of gave me the, the idea that like, uh, that it needed more mass and more substance and more, uh, needed to be fastened together better, it needed to be made out of a stronger, like, <clears throat> like every single detail of this thing needed to be fixed in order to really make it do what it was trying to do. Uh, now, it, it worked really well for about an hour. Uh, <laughs> but it didn't hold up long enough for how long you wanted to play with it. Yeah, as soon as I started getting into it, uh, I just tore it apart. It, I could see that it needed to, to have like a more durable surface. And uh, I didn't have a real solution for that. And uh, I could see that it needed to be held on better on the ends. And, uh, you know, I had, had an idea that, that a screw, that any kind of screw screwed into the end only weakened it. I, I, I kind of had real good ideas about what was wrong with it, but I didn't have enough experience to really understand what would be right with it until I uh, ran across uh, some people selling sticks at Saturday Market, uh, flying clipper foot bags. They mostly sold leather foot bags and uh, reed and toes. And I'm pretty sure they're around uh, still. They were both really masterful footbag manipulators. They had this way of wrapping the shaft of the stick in leather so that you couldn't really see a seam and it looked like it was just dipped in suede. And uh, the texture of the suede seemed almost perfect. They had a suede handle and a suede uh, main stick. I, I call the main stick the baton and the two control sticks, the wands. And they had suede on all three surfaces. I, I think that that was too little grip for me. Uh, and it 
required too much impact and and leverage and torque and like it wasn't I wanted it more lazy and less you know uh, so uh, their stick was really good as far as the the grip on the middle but it could be better and anything slightly aggressive would knock their the stick apart because they they had the same kind of a disc screwed onto the end it relied on this tiny screw and if it was any bigger it would be too big and the and the wood would be too weak and if it was any smaller it would be too small and couldn't hold the thing on so it really had to be a screw about that long just barely half the width of the dowel uh, well i broke that i broke it over and over and uh you know they were really happy to fix it but like every time the the screw would break out of the wood the wood would have to have like another five eighths of an inch cut off of that end so the stick was getting shorter and i kind of liked it at its maximum length and, so I kind of decided that I wanted a longer stick and I wanted something that really held on on the end. And I wanted something that had a little more traction that had that smoothness of the, of the uh, suede. And uh, I just started putting elements together. One of the things that I did was uh, the, the first the first main thing I did was to put the what I call the flops on the end. Uh, people call them tassels, but they're like it's a thing that flops on the end of the stick. And when the, when you stop the stick, uh, instead of the stick just stopping and it is falling, uh, the stick stops and then the flop continues to move, and so it kind of conserves momentum and. Uh, gives a nice hang for when you start to push it back it it's really slow at moving back the other way because it's floppy instead of stiff so uh it just seems it just seems more artful and like it could go with more different kinds of music and that it's uh it's just a bigger more committed motion and uh flow arts and and juggling and other uh, skills like that seem to have this thing of uh, you make the easy stuff look hard and you make the hard stuff look easy. And uh, so this floppiness on the end, and then, well, we, we eventually added, uh, made the uh, wands covered in rubber. So it was rubber on suede with the floppy leather. And, and uh, that really, uh, it changed it so much that really right at first, when I first made the first set, everybody who saw it that had any kind of understanding of how sticks worked at all would come running over to me and like, want to pretty much worship at my feet uh, you know uh, they would be oh man I I've never seen anybody do sticks like that and I'd be like it's the sticks it's the sticks <laughs> check out the sticks and they'd be like oh wow these sticks are the best where do you get them you can't get them anywhere you have to make them oh how do you make them well here's how <laughs> you got 45 minutes <laughs> and then I would just I would tell them the whole from start to finish. It's crazy detailed if you want to make a perfect set of sticks at many different uh, venues like Renaissance Fair, country fairs, dead shows, where people are selling sticks and just uh, like take whatever sticks they've got and just like demo them. But like before I leave, I always end up turning them on to the full you know, well, this is how I make my set, you know, check it out here. This with my sticks, it looks like this. With your sticks, it looks like this. You know, make yourself a set of these. You'd like it. <laughs> and uh, 
I, you know, that's something that's one of the things that I'm the most proud of that an idea I came up with on the strength of its, of its goodness. Uh, it kind of went around the world pretty much under its own steam. And uh, you know how when you tell, us, tell somebody something, it's like the telephone game where at the other end, it comes out different. Well, these sticks that I see are coming from around the world. They're not that different. I mean, there's some people that really got it that are making sticks now. And I'm really digging that. Like, it's not just people making toys because you can sell toys. You know, it's people making stuff because they feel good about the thing that they're making. And they think they can make it as good as any of the other people, you know, they can make it as good as buying from me because I, I, I price my sticks so that I don't have to make them. You know, uh, the cheapest I'll make a stick for is a hundred bucks. And uh, I think almost everybody who sells sticks has sticks for way less than that. Um, but I just, I'm not interested in handling the glue or keeping a stockpile of leather. I, I, not even sure how I feel about leather. I, you know, I really only want a set of sticks, sticks for me. And uh, I'm happy to share my design with everybody, but I don't want to be the stick maker. So I'm glad there's other people that are doing it. That's really, really interesting to know. So like it's available if people are like, I want the best stick out there. I want Glenn sticks, but you're not, you're not stockpiling materials on the side. Like you make them for the love of like, this is an exciting thing that I'm creating for you to be excited about to play with because it, it's the pure passion and love that drives yeah. you. When a stick breaks, like if you spend an hour and a half, which is really to make a really nice set of sticks, there is an hour and a half of, uh, of effort into it. And when you put an hour and a half into something and then it breaks, that's really, really disappointing, you know, and uh, the, uh, the wood shafts, we were deciding that we just couldn't get good enough straight, good grain wood shafts uh, that wouldn't break for in any kind of a level where uh, it was repeatable. It would be like go to the store and look at all of their dowels and maybe pick one or two of them out. And, you know, it's you can do that kind of thing if you're just making a stick for yourself, but it's unsustainable to only take the very best of the materials and make your set out of them. And then everybody else's sticks suck because they've got the other sticks that weren't that good. Uh, what we're kind of looking to do is design something that was the stick equivalent of that $200 pro tennis racket that, uh, that you would play tennis with. The tennis was what you made your money doing. Uh, so we wanted something that wouldn't break and that would be able to be fixed and that Nobody could make one better than this. And you could make one yourself. So that, that's the things that it had to be like, no company could tool up with tools and out tool you making a better stick. And someone at home with normal tools could make the stick and it, it would last forever and you and you could always repair it if you broke it uh the leather wrap worked really good with the aluminum and the leather wrapped uh flops on the end worked really well to hold that down and uh and to reinforce that leather as being tightly held onto the shaft and is that the part that you were talking about with some friends in Richardson Grove about changing what material was made from? And oh, yeah. Yeah, we were sitting inside of a, of a tree, um, a redwood tree, a post-redwood. 
and you can see all the way out the top, you can see the sky. But it was just enough room for us to sit in a little triangle and, and talk and be like really focused. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do that weekend was have this conversation. But we were kind of talking about uh, fiberglass and um, carbon fiber. And one of the problems that I had found with those was that no matter how nice they are to start with, there's always that one spot on the stick that gets hit over and over and over. And the, the hard plastic with the fibers inside of it breaks at that spot. And eventually you've got a, a floppy, wobbly spot. And we kind of rejected fiberglass as being the right material. This was very early on in uh, awareness of tent poles that were made out of aluminum, Easton aluminum. But we were aware that Easton was making like uh, hockey sticks and uh, tennis rackets and you know things that needed to be strong and durable for a long time. We came up with the idea that we would kind of standardize around for a little bit. Aluminum on all three shafts, the baton and the wands, and rubber on the wands and leather on the baton, the flop on the baton, and the length of the baton, we kind of had been thinking about length versus arm length. And uh, I don't know how what everybody else thinks about that at this point, but I've gone away from that. I think that uh, the length doesn't really have anything to do with your size or shape of your body, but more with the uh, what kind of movement you want to do with it. This is my secret. I haven't shared this with anybody else in the world yet. This is the one, uh, the one thing I've kept for me. And I've, I've told a few, I've told a few people about it, but not people that are building sticks, but uh, my baton is made out of an Easton shaft that uh, it's an arrow shaft and it's double tapered so that at each end it's thick and in the middle it's thin. So it's flexible in the middle where you want it to be flexible, but it's really stout and stiff on the ends. So it, it's, uh, it's really good. Like if you do a real high toss, that's got a lot of momentum in it. You can suck all that momentum out when you catch it really easily with the flex that you know, like it, it lands and it kind of flexes down and comes back up and it's completely invisible. You can't see it. And, and nobody really suspects that it would be that, that wiggly in the middle uh, and that stiff on the end. You know, I hit it pretty hard for it to be as flexible as it is. That's but, uh, magic. <laughs> there's kind of a magic thing to arrow shafts themselves. Like, uh, when you shoot an arrow shaft, it bends way off of its trajectory and wobbles back and forth and, and still ends up on its, you know, on its bullseye. And uh, so it is, it is super that using that kind of materials, it is magic. It gives me like another 2% that nobody else has. And you know, now everybody will have it that wants it. Everybody, everybody who wants it enough to make their own set of sticks, because I don't care. You, you can't buy a set of sticks from me that's as good as you can make for yourself. Uh, everybody has more of an understanding of what they need than anyone else can have. And I think, I think that that, that goes with like your emotions. You know what you need emotionally. It goes with like uh, 
you know, what kind of car do you need to drive? What kind of job do you need to have? What are your needs? Everybody knows their own needs so much better than someone else can. I mean, um, you can find out about opportunities, things that you could want, but. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing with us that, that secret, that innovation, that's your personal <laughs> stick secret, but also that wisdom that about that we each contain our own answers. So when you started out with these innovations, what challenges did you face along the way that you may have not foreseen at the beginning? Actually, I would say the absence of the internet, uh, because most of the research and stuff that I had to look up was not, uh, you know, even when the internet was around, uh, it didn't have everything on it yet and i know everything's not on the internet now but it feels a lot more like it now than it did one of the big difficulties with making uh like sticks is that uh for one stick you need three not 50 uh aluminum we'll call them dowels tent poles or arrow shafts or whatever you're using and maybe one of those is different from the other two and so those have to be bought retail or uh, somebody has to co-op together to get more than one so that you can order the minimum amount or when you're venting something and you're trying out different materials and you don't want to go bulk you just want to right. try it out it sounds like you had you made some connections with particular companies that could give you smaller amounts or, you know, just one. You know, I was in conversations on Facebook just the other day where people are still looking for answers to these questions. And, you know, there's better materials, but, uh, and, and we keep asking all of these questions again and again, what's, what's the stiffest tubing what's what tubing has the most balance but without kinking uh you know where can i get carbon fiber one inch that's really stiff you know all of the stuff it's uh instead of having to spend like a year wandering around going to festivals and and uh stopping at every little junk store and and uh asking hardware guys and machinists and making phone calls to people that are way too busy to answer your question. And it was the same thing. You know, you look and you find the information and you find what's the thing you want. And then you start trying to find where you can get it at the price you can buy it for. And what's really stood out to you as you've watched the flower sticks grow in popularity? the style of what people do. Like I see people doing three stick uh, tricks. Yeah, well, they're basically juggling, but they're doing, uh, you know, they're doing tricks with all three of them while keeping them all going and not colliding. I've seen people do like, you know, parallel sticks where they've got two sticks on each side and they're doing the same thing with, with each stick. and. Uh, you know, I've seen people working with short sticks doing this, uh, I'm going to call it Alien John style because uh, Alien John is, is the one that I, I've seen do the most of it, of like going on the outside and then on the inside, and just like uh, creating the whole, the whole spectrum of, you know, uh, I have this thing of that it's all one trick that like anything you do is a variation of any other trick and uh, some of these maneuvers kind of really show that like, you know, this thing here is the same as this thing here and uh, that there's a, a real, uh, a real continuity that uh, there's also this outside thing here is the same as this inside thing here. And if you really look at it, every trick that you can do with sticks is 
is the same thing that you're you're lifting the stick from somewhere not in the middle and not at the end and it's starting to turn either a lot or a little depending on what you're doing with it and you're lifting it either hard or soft and you're you know you're cheating the stick one way or the other way as you're trying to change your angle and you know every every little aspect of it changes what what's being done but uh those are all just parameters like uh you could have like zero to 90 angle of your stick crossing you can have you know uh whatever angle uh, to vertical whatever extension on your arm whatever horizontal motion uh whatever uh, uh whatever rolling motion of the of the hand stick against the and really if you look at it all of flow arts is all one trick like the same thing that you can do with devil sticks you can do with uh with poi mm -hmm. and uh is the trick the motion or like physics itself or well you know, I, that's a really interesting philosophy. We could probably talk about that for a couple of hours. Burning Dan uh, kind of had this thing that he wrote about flow for Flow Temple. Uh, he and the Tea Fairy started the Flow Temple. Uh, and and I'm not, I don't want to leave everybody else out. There's probably about eight other people who've got to have credit there too. But, uh, you know, they they talked about that flow is a good name for it. And they're trying to find a name that was, you know, the dojo for this kind of stuff. And uh, his manifesto in included words to the effect of what we're looking for is the feeling of the flow, not learning a bunch of tricks. The tricks are secondary. Uh, it's the feeling that you get from the movement that we're looking for. And uh, so in light of what Dan says, uh, and the idea that it's all one trick, really, that expands to everything, not just uh, that sticks and poi are the same, but sticks and poi and balls are the same, sticks and poi and going to the grocery store shopping for vegetables is the same. And really, all of these things are the thing you you know you have a human body and it's a specific dimension and it has specific capabilities and you have the universe around it that has these things in it and you can customize what things are in your local universe so that, like you could have a bedroom full of juggling clubs or it, you know all of that what you have around you isn't so much the trick as what you do with it and uh, you know, I really think that just life itself is the same as the trick you're doing when you're doing some radical spin with the sticks. Thank you so much for sharing your philosophy. In fact, <laughs> actually, that was a question that one of the Art of Flow listeners submitted for me to ask you on this podcast. What do you think of the commercialization of your design and what's happened since you put it out into the world? And I never wanted my my uh, design to be something where, oh, we could make it a little bit cheaper if we do this. I, I didn't want it, anything about it to be about how cheap it could be made, but I also didn't want it to be something that uh, was only elite. You know, you could only make it out of aluminum. Uh, so, and I didn't set out to design the perfect set of sticks, but I knew that I didn't want to design a better set of sticks and then have some company come along and go, oh, well, that's a very nice patent. We'll uh, put a tapered point on the end and call it ours. <laughs> you know, so I made it so that it couldn't be patented. And the way I did that is by making it be prior art. Once 
everyone in the community already knew about the design and was already making variants of it and, and freely using it, it makes it so that all of the design that all, not just me, but all of everything that everybody else added to it becomes prior art. And any patent that gets written has to recognize all of that prior art. And in order to get a patent, they're gonna to have to explain why all of that prior art is, is relevant. And you know that's just gonna be doing us a favor Nobody's really written down all the physics of why why sticks work the way they do. You know, it's clearly a pendulum and it's clearly a rotation like a gyroscope. And uh, it's clearly also not either of those things purely. And then when you start adding in the flop and, uh, and create it so that there's an eccentric weighting. You know, we're playing with just bald physics, you know, gravity and all of the different physical laws. Just checking my understanding, you mentioned ballistics, you mentioned pendular motion, and you also mentioned one more. Was it? Um, oh, like a gyroscopic. Gy gyroscopic. Yeah, and there's some things that are kind of combinations of, of those. Uh, now, when I say pendulum, I'm talking about a weight at the end of something that describes a regular back and forth. It has a periodicity to it, uh, that like a certain length with a certain weight on the end takes a certain length of time to move. And, you can change the movement characteristics by changing where it rotates from, where, where, the, where the hang point is, or changing how much weight is effectively used, or even, even holding it in a, in a place that it's not rotating from and, and kind of cheating the rotation around that center. There's, you know, there's, a lot of things that have to do with the pendulum. Mm -hmm. But then a pendulum that goes all the way around, that starts to be a wheel. Mm -hmm. And if it goes around with any kind of speed at all, it starts to have centrifugal force and gyroscopic precession and all of the things that a gyroscope does or that a that like maybe a spinning bicycle wheel hanging from a string might do. Uh, and then there's, there's things like a, a seesaw, like a, that, a lever, the way a lever works, that a long lever has more mechanical advantage over the system than a short lever. A long lever takes a really long time to move back and forth. The short levers go really fast. Uh, the shorter you get, the less leverage you have. So it's very hard to do that fast back and forth. So at any, at any speed or any mass or any length of stick that you're dealing with, there's there's a sweet spot that's a different size or different location that's just where you wanna put the stick. Uh, there's ballistics. The ballistics is the tendency of, uh, it, it, ballistics is the branch of physics that deals with objects whose center of mass are describing a parabola like a tossed ball or a stick that's spinning through the air. I mean, as a stick spins through the air and uh, the outer part is, is rotating madly, that center of gravity in the middle, the center of mass, to be more precise, is describing a perfect parabola just by mathematical certainty and the laws of physics and, and like, 
just you can absolutely trust that that's what it's doing. And so you you combine, and there's several other there's several other variants that that affect sticks, but each one of those is a is a type of physics that has its own little tricks and its own little funny math things that happen. And uh, you know, like there's a physics of rotating bodies where something that has a a mass on the end that's sort of shaped like a T, if it's spun around its long axis, it tends to want to change direction periodically. And so that like, it'll rotate this way with the handle sticking out like this. And then after a little bit, it'll suddenly flip and rotate that opposite way with the handle sticking out this way. And it's just sort of a, it goes through phases of its movement. And, and you'll get that with the sticks. Like if you just stick the wand in under the stick and crank it around in a circle, uh, it eventually walks its way to one end of the stick or nearer to one end of the, end of the stick and just kind of pops off, right? So as you're cranking it around, you constantly have to keep cheating it back towards the sweet spot because once you get outside the sweet spot, you've lost any any control of it and it's, it's doing its own thing. That's fascinating, the breakdown, because that's the beauty of Florence is you get to experience these properties of physics experientially, not just intellectually, but in real time in your body, you're noticing and feeling the impacts that go on in our natural world around us. We're starting to wind down I ask every guest on the show a really tough question. Ask, what is your ideal world? I really think that we need a world where everyone can have access to like any kind of tool that humans have should be somewhere in a system. Like we can check out any book in the whole state? Why can't we just check out any tool in the whole state? Uh, and if there aren't enough uh, plunge routers or uh, uh, 72 inch belt sanders, then maybe we should buy some more. And maybe we should have school type locations where you can teach classes that not necessarily have schools monopolize all of the school space that we have, but maybe have uh, space spaces available for people to work on projects and, and to uh, get together and build things and to innovate and like, you know, maker spaces. We need a lot more uh, maker spaces and we need to make it something that's available to everyone and pretty much need to do it right away because we just had a piece of history where everybody lost their jobs and uh, you know I hate to be the bearer of bad news but we're not all getting jobs again you know pretty much everyone in the world is gonna to have to invent some kind of new thing that uh, they can do so that uh, everyone around them can be a little bit more fulfilled and, and, and feel like you're doing your share. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts about that question. And I really love that you brought it into the territory of talking about maker spaces and you know, giving ourselves the empowerment to create, to make with our own hands, the tools to do so. Is yeah. there anything else that you want to share with listeners? Yeah, it's it's never so bad that it can't get worse. And, and uh, it's never so bad that uh, you're not going to feel a little bit better if you go out and 
play with a toy and get yourself a little bit out of your head and meditate a little bit on nothing at all. Uh, we spend a lot of time with our brains really uh, tightly focused on, on real specific things. And uh, we just need to relax a little bit from that sometimes. Do you want to keep the conversation going? Join the Art of Flow Facebook group to be part of a community discussing episodes, sharing art, resources, and questions with each other. Thank you for listening and see you next time.